Well, good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. Grateful for any visitors that we have with us this morning to join and to worship us now uh, through the preaching of God's Word. Well, let's pray. My heart is just so weighted with the glory that's before us this morning, and I want to ask God to do what no man can do but only the Holy Spirit of God, and that He would now illuminate this Word to our mind and our hearts. And so let's join together and pray to this God. Father, we come before you and we acknowledge that we now dwell in the presence of the whole Trinity, which is nothing but grace. And so we do worship you and we thank you for this amazing salvation that you've given to us. I thank you, Father, for what you've taught us in this journey in First Peter. And I pray now for what we're going to summarize and look at, that you would indeed let us understand this in our minds and then that you would stir our affections and our wills would be activated to serve the King of Kings. So I pray for gospel motivations in every member of this body. I pray that you will move now through the Word of God and that we will worship you through the beauties and the glory of what is revealed in it. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 then. I'm just going to kind of give you a bird's eye view as we finish up this section here is my takeaway from a year and a half then of studying this epistle, just hundreds of hours of laboring in it and praying over each section and asking God to, to let me understand it, to take over my mind and heart with this truth. And here's what I think Peter wants us then to come away with. He wants us to come away with a rock-solid hope of a, re, of a reward beyond this life. To, to come away that, that in verse 4 we learned of a certainty of this hope that God has laid up for us in heaven. And so it's, he says you're born again to a living hope. We had dead hopes in this world and God gave us life. He caused us to be birthed to this hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it's a hope that is to eclipse all other hopes that you have. It's to live on this bedrock hope of glory, of what we have in Jesus Christ. It's an absolute certainty for the child of God. And Peter wants us to get that and understand it, and it's going to change the way you live as we've been journeying through this epistle. To, to think and to act in such a way, in light of this blessed hope, that the world would look at us and say, that's not natural, that doesn't fit with this world and its thinking and what it pursues, it's otherworldly. And your hopes, Christians, they're not built on what our hopes are built on. You guys are completely different. You're not running after the American dream. You're going after Jacob's dream. You're not after health and wealth and prosperity. Your hope is in the glory of God. And that is what their, their eyes are fixed on. And it seems that whatever comes against you, Christians... It just can't dim that hope, but it just seems to get brighter with any humiliations and trials that come upon you in this world. This hope causes us then to respond, Peter said, to mistreatment and to persecution and to trials in a humble, loving, peaceable, gracious way so that people will say, what is the hope within you? There's something different about you. I have never seen this in anybody that I know. What is it? Your life can only be explained by your hope, which is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The church is a gathering of born-again believers in Christ who hope with finality on the coming to you grace of God. Our behavior is totally different than those who are trying to find their hope in the here and now and in this world. We are set apart and we are different. Amen? Amen. I want you to hear a few verses of Peter. Just take this back in again of where we've journeyed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, <clears throat> even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. 1 Peter 3, 5. 
For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. They, they had a hope in God. 1 Peter 3, 9, that when, when you get mistreated, he says, we don't return evil for evil or insult for insult, but we give a blessing instead. Why? For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. You can release, you can release the, the persecutions that come upon you and not defend yourself because I have a hope beyond all of this. 1 Peter 4, 13, to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. And now we come to chapter 5. Elders, shepherd the flock of God, not for pay or power or rank, not to drive around others like cattle, but he says shepherd the flock of God in humility. Why? Because you don't need all of that now. Lay it all down for the flock of God, and you get glory later when the chief shepherd appears. True eldership makes no sense without this blessed hope. Humility, he turns and says, not pride. What that, that Greek word, it was a passive imperative to allow then in verse 6 the humiliations of life to come upon you, to be humble. And then at the proper time, God may exalt you with an eye to future glory. We keep waiting for that day when everything's going to be flipped. And humble contentment then is going to shine like the noonday sun in this life. And so we, what we have learned since we opened up this book is very simple, is that it's suffering now and the glory is to follow. I don't know why we have to remind the church of God of that. This is a call to take up your cross and die and deny yourselves and follow after Christ now. Sufferings will come now. Trials, God's promise, to humiliations that he will bring into your life. It is a suffering now with the glory that is to follow. And so I want us to... to Behold that and embrace it. And look at verse, chapter 5, verse 1. This jumped off the page at me this week. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. I watched Christ in all of his sufferings, and I was a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so suffering now, just like with Christ, now exalted in glory. And our path will be the same. It's going to be a path through suffering unto glory. And Peter's going to drive that point home again now as he finishes up this major, major argument with some closing comments. So we'll take up where we left off then in verse 8. Verse 8, be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so this is what's called an ecclusio. If you'll go back to remember 1 Peter 1.13, where he said, therefore, after that beautiful section of the gospel, in light of that, therefore, prepare your minds for actions, keep sober in spirit, and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And now he's going to come at the end and tell us the same thing. Be sober spirit, be on the alert, the end is near. It just seems like Peter really can't get over this. The reason, I think, is simple. Peter wasn't sober and alert. Jesus Christ told him, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, no way, there's nothing within me that could ever do that. His pride, this whole context has been pride and humility. And Peter's pride said, no way. There's nothing, Jesus, inside of my heart that would ever betray you or deny you. And so the pride brought about a major humbling in his life. And so Peter's saying there's a roaring lion seeking to devour you. Peter was full of pride and he fell badly to that lion. And so he wants you to not make the same mistake. The persecution is rising upon this church and he's saying your life is at stake for the name of Christ. And it's going to be very easy to save your own skin and deny the master. That's what's coming upon this church that's been scattered throughout Turkey. That is what the roaring lion is after. And Peter is saying, I want you to be sober, and I want you to be alert. I want you to be vigilant because the devil is on the prowl, and he wants to destroy your faith. He is a roaring lion. And so I want to just take a look then at these two words of warning 
that Peter is almost just pleading with his flock, and I'm pleading with you this morning, in these days, these end days, be of sober spirit. And we spent a lot of time back in verse 13 in chapter 4, verse 7, and so I don't want to rehash the whole thing, but it was the idea of, of moderation, to, to not take in so much of this world that we're drunk to what our real hope is, to not keep just taking it all in and you're so drunk with this world, you're, you're, just, you're not even thinking and hoping in what this is all about in Christ's return. So be sober, have moderation, don't be drinking up this world, be, be focusing and looking and hastening what all this is about. Come Lord Jesus, don't get lost in drunkenness with this world, uh, drink, don't drink it up. So it will seem really, really distant if you do that. Spend a day just Netflix binging. Spend a day watching bowl games. All you can eat buffets or gaming all day. And I'll tell you, this hope will start to smolder. You will bite and devour, Peter said, every epithumia, every over desire that you have in your heart again and again. There'll be nothing to buttress these desires without a strong hope and glory. The way you're going to fight sin is to have this strong set hope and God coming back in the glory that's going to be revealed when he does. So here and now has to be your hope and your focus uh, on that coming. So be sober and be on the alert. What are we to be on the alert for? Well, Peter says a prowling lion who attacks suddenly and viciously. Usually unsuspecting when the victim is engaged in routine activities, just going about life, like in the days of Noah, eating, drinking, and marrying, and then the Son of Man will come. Be on the alert. There's this, this lion prowling around ready to jump on you and attack. And so we have a theology that the, the devil, if it's just this cute little guy in a red suit with a pitchfork, or, or that he's been conquered, and there's no need to even think about him. My only battles with my flesh, forget the devil, that'll keep me busy all day long. Or we make him sovereign and we fear him all of our days. This morning, Peter's going to give us a right balance and a right thinking about the devil. But the first thing is be on the alert. <laughs> be on the alert for him. For the most beautiful and wise of all the created angels fell because of what? Pride. Our whole section, he had pride and he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be God. He didn't have humility. And now he prowls around like a lying, seeking whom he may devour in your pride, in your self-sufficiency, and you're looking to your own strength. He's looking for guys like you and girls like you to come and devour you in your pride and self-confidence. He's roaring. He's looking for it. And Peter says, you better be on the alert because he asked Jesus for permission to sift him like wheat. And he got him really, really good. And you will see in our passage that Christ prayed for Peter that what? His faith would not fail and that he would be strengthened. And now he's writing these letters to all of us. So I want you to see Peter's an example of last week. Allow yourself the humiliations of life to break his pride. And now he's being exalted at the proper time to put God on display for all to marvel and look at what he did in Peter's life. So he begins saying, you better distrust your own heart because he didn't. You better distrust your own love for Jesus. It's not enough to stand against the enemy. You better look to what we learned last week, to look to the mighty hand of God. You better look to the mighty hand of God. There's no room for pride in this warning. I want you to hear it. Anyone who sits here saying that's for somebody else, you're missing this. Humility is there's nothing in me to get me to the finish line but grace and grace alone. That is what humility is. And so he said last week, casting our anxiety in verse 7 upon the Lord, that there's even a devil who wants to devour you. And he's a junkyard dog tethered to the will of God under the mighty hand of God is what I'm going to show you this morning, where I'm safe. My own resources, I will get knocked down. I will be devoured. But humility looks to God and to him alone. And he is able, we're going to see in this passage, to cause us to stand, as Romans 14 tells us. So our adversary, the devil, uh, the, the word here is diabolos. He's a slanderer, the evil one, 
the, the fallen one. The, the, he, he prowls about, and listen to this, he's, he's roaring. He wants to, to sneak up. Uh, he wants to scare you to death and sneak up and roar. You know, have you ever walked by those cars where the, you don't know there's a dog in them and the window's cracked and <laughs> you jump 10 feet? That's it. Uh, quiet, you're walking, normal things, and he's ready to roar and just come and scare you. And so my question is, how does a devil roar? I've never heard him do that. I seem to miss half the time when he's devouring me. He's halfway done eating me before I even realize he's doing it. Roaring doesn't seem to me like a surprise, or it doesn't seem like you should miss roaring. So I come back to the context, what is the roaring? This roaring is to tempt you to pride. The whole section's been pride and humility. So his roaring is, I, I want to get you looking to yourself. Persecution, the, the whole section has been suffering. He said it again and again. So I'm going to try to bring suffering and get you to look to your own strength and suffering and your own thoughts and how you should think about the sufferings that are in your life. He wants this world to come against you and threaten you, and then he's going to attack you. And you're going to either respond with flesh against flesh, you're going to deny him, or your hope is, is not seen. It's, it's laughed at. And so you, you look to yourself to argue. You look to yourself to defend. You're going to show your boss or your employees, you're going to show they're wrong. Or you're going to start protesting. You're going to tell your boss, I quit. You're going to look to all these ways to solve your problems and your humiliations and how to get through them with your own strength. And I'm telling you, you're going to get devoured as you do this. That's all pride. That is the persecution now, and he's roaring, and he wants to devour you. Same word in the Septuagint in Jonah 1.17 where it said, the whale swallowed Jonah. He wants to swallow you up. He wants to make you like a Judas or a Demas. He wants you to live in pride. And what did we learn two weeks ago? That the grace of God, he's opposed to the proud. So the pride dams up the grace of God that's going to be changing and conforming us to the image of Christ. So if he gets us to pride, you're blocking any help from God. And now everything you have to face this trial and persecution and humiliations is, is your own strength. And the, the devil's going to win. He's going to devour you you will lose. So the devil comes and he roars at us to induce fear in us. The persecution is to make us afraid. And whatever it is, what he said in verse 7 is it's anxiety. It, it brings anxiety into our lives. And so it's, it's to make us fear, to look at the humiliations that are coming and be afraid of them and get anxious, to act like a people whose hope is in this earth, and if we don't get the best of this earth, we're undone and we're anxious. And so this anxiety of humiliations that will be coming, and I'm telling you, that is not why Christ died for us. We're an anxious, anxious people. And what we have here is how to be a people who are steadfast and trusting and confident in their God. All I could think of this week is what a, what a contrast in this section. There's a devil who wants to double your worries he wants to terrify you. He doesn't want to comfort you, but he wants to make you anxious. And he doesn't want to deliver you from fear, but he wants to devour you in your fear. And then we have this God in verses 6 through 7 who wants to comfort you and give you peace because he cares for you. He's got this sovereign hand who's working in your life and taking care of you and can, can protect you and he's using everything for your good and he wants to give you this peace that I can just surrender to Almighty God and live under his wing and his protection and his sovereignty. So one wants to destroy you with anxieties and fears and just cause you to be weak and helpless and do nothing and the other is a God who wants to remove them and take them and give you peace like a mighty river. What a, what a contrast in this section. We saw that pride then is to have God opposed to you and grace is to have his favor flowing. And now the devil is seeking to devour you by making you very feel fearful until it is placed in the context of God who now tells you what he will do for you. And we're going to look at this. It's so sweet. But humiliations and trials, please see it. It says allow yourself the humiliations. They 
They come from the hand of God. I want to just put that to bed right now as they're, they're not coming from the devil. He's roaring and he's seeking whom he will devour. But I want you to see there's a God who's just taking this junkyard dog tethered to his will and using him exactly the way he wants like he did in Job. In these tests and sufferings and trials and persecution, there's a devil prowling, prowling seeking to devour, devour you at these times. And you're going to see in verses 9 through 10, though, I want you to bring now, there's a real devil, and he's trying to devour you, and he wants to give you anxieties and fears and mess you up. But I want you to come now, and we're going to bring it all under the mighty hand of God, who will accomplish all that he wants through these humiliations of life. If we have the grace of God, I have everything that I need for life and godliness. If I have that grace flowing, uh, stand we will. And so I want you to now be able to understand and think through that, that there is a devil who wants to destroy you, but there's a mighty hand of God that's over your life, and there's just nothing to fear if God is for us who could be against us. So look with me then. We're going to look at verse 9. What do we do then? But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So we need to resist them. He's prowling and he wants to devour you and your call is to resist him. So how do I resist him? I bind you in the name of Jesus? No. You resist him by being firm in your faith. The faith of all that I just went over in Peter. God is finishing the work that he began in each one of us by humiliations and trials. Do you remember back in verse 5? He says, you are protected by the power of God. What is that power? He takes your faith and he sticks it in a furnace and he boils off unbelief and impurities and he makes an approved faith that trusts him and loves him more. And so here he is. God is, is, is taking you and putting you in trials and purifying your faith so that you will make it to the very end. This is God who's saying, I will keep purifying your faith so you will stand and stand and resist this devil. And so he's calling you to believe, to believe this. It's not enough to just nod your head to the sovereignty of God. He's calling us to believe and entrust and give ourselves to this truth 100%. You are done if God is just some genie that you rub when you need him. You're done if God is only here to make you happy. If you believe that, you're finished. You're going to get devoured holding to that kind of lie. If his only goal is to make you healthy, wealthy, and prosperous, you're going to get devoured because they're going to come and it isn't going to ha- that isn't going to happen. And if that is what you believe, at this point, the devil's talons are in you and you are going to be devoured. But children of God, resist firm in your faith. And what does that mean? Does this mean that his claws never come and his teeth never sink into our flesh? Absolutely not. Some of you have that even this morning. Allow the humiliations of life. So what this means is when he comes in roaring to devour and he attacks you, you don't stop believing in the sure word of God. You don't start letting your own mind reason and and go away from what God says is true that I've tried every other alternative to fight this, and every other one has come up short. There's no other way to fight this. Everyone's looking for a secret. (laughs) This is the secret. Believe the Word of God, which means you got to know it. you got to know it to believe it. And we have to quit being churches that want to make things light and exciting so we can build bigger churches and barns. But we need to labor over this book, praying and asking the Spirit to cause us to believe it. That's my application every Sunday. Believe it. Believe what we just looked at and unfolded in this Word. And so you don't look at all that you're going through. You don't say, how can God's children be treated this way? You don't say, God doesn't really love me or these things wouldn't be happening. I guess God's just like my dad. He doesn't really care for me after all. He would never let me suffer this hard and this deep. I wonder if there's even a God. He's saying that's pride, and that's looking to your own resources and your own thoughts. i got to fight that, and I've got to come and believe the Word of God and resist all that He's saying. 
Pride is telling God how he has to work and what he has to do. We got to quit trying to be God and say, you got to do this in my life. This is the only way to do things. He says, stop. It's pride. I submit to God. I don't tell God how to run his universe or my life. I come under him. I submit. That's whole, the whole theme has been submission to God as you wait for this blessed hope. Pride looks to self. I'm telling you, resist in the humility of faith. Faith looks away from anything in yourself and it looks only to God. That's a definition of humility. Christ is all. And I look to him and I look to that Christ and I stay humble, rejoicing and loving, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. That is how you resist in your faith. And so he has teeth in my jugular and he's roaring and fear is rising really, really fast. And faith comes and says, I'm under the mighty hand of God. I'm under this hand. And I watched the devil flee at the words of Jesus. And I watched him fall at the cross. He is under the mighty hand of God. Amen? Don't miss that. The devil himself in this context, he's roaring to devour and he's under the mighty hand of God. And what is more, that hand loves me. And I'm going to cast all my anxiety upon that hand because he cares for me. What a hand to be under. By the work of Jesus Christ, I'm under a favorable, sovereign hand of God who's a father working everything for my good. He really does care for me. Isn't that beautiful? It's not just something to not... He cares for me. And guys, even if it will cost you your life as they threaten and persecute you, you know what that is? That's a roar. Stand firm in your faith because later Peter is restored like he's going to say in verse 10 what God will come and do. And Peter now could actually look at his own wife. They say that she was crucified first and he wouldn't recant. And then he went and was crucified upside down. The devil was roaring. And under the mighty hand of God, this time Peter went and he had the victory and he put God on display. Even to this day, we still rejoice in it. And so guys, we resist him by faith. I think it was Journey, the theologians, who said, don't stop believing. <laughs> don't stop believing. That's what this is. This is you, you've so cemented these truths in your mind and your heart. I, can't, I just, I believe. I'm under his hand and he's bringing these things for purpose and reasons I don't even understand. And then Peter says, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And so I, I call this the Elijah complex, where I'm the only one suffering persecution and hatred from this world. I'm the only one left, God. Everyone else is unfaithful. And so get this. This is God's design for all Christians. For all Christians. All over the world right now, they're suffering for the name of Jesus. And finally, in our country, we're getting to join in some. And, and we're wanting to protest it and fight it. This is it. The devil is roaring. And he's seeking to devour Christians. And I want you to see that this is not strange. This is the plan of God. Nothing's running out of control. This is the plan of God through suffering and then glory. So what kind of a plan is this? This is awful. <laughs> Why would anyone sign up for this? The same reason anyone would ever be an elder. Look with me in verse 10. But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The word but here, it's an adversative. It's used 28 times by Peter to show a very distinct contrast. And so here's the contrast. The devil is seeking to devour you. That's true. It's real. All Christians are facing it. Not just you. This is all over the world. It's happening. But on the complete adversative, I want you to hear this. Yes, that's going on. But the one who called you who will persevere you to the very end, your faith is not going to fail just like Peter's didn't. The name of God is at stake. 
all of his glory is based on you getting to the finish line. He's called you to glory, and God says, I will finish it. I will do it. And so all that you're feeling, your hands are weak. You feel like you're going to quit. You're ready to faint. I am getting devoured. And he's saying, come back. There's a God who's going to hold you. His grace is what's going to bring you through all of these trials and humiliations of life. And some of you, you just, you've journeyed so many things. And I want you to sit here this morning going, the grace of God, I sit here still loving Christ. And he says, his His power in that mighty hand is going to bring you to glory. Hell itself. Christ said the devil can't. Nothing can snatch you out of my hand. I'm going to bring you to glory. The lion ain't going to devour your faith. Does it feel like it at times? Yeah. But I want you to hear that loud and clear from God himself. He isn't going to devour you. He's only going to use it to strengthen your faith. And after you have suffered for a little while, well, how long is a little while? It it kind of feels a little longer right now, Pastor. I think it's vague in the amount of time, and it's purposeful. And you'll remember back in verse 6, he said the same thing of chapter 1. And so it it can mean in time. And and so it can mean that, guys, you you suffer, hang in there. There's a season where God's going to bring you out of it, and it's going to turn But we know that ultimately there's a lot of talking about glory and when he comes here. So I just know this, that there's going to be a time in eternity when glory is going to come and you'll never know another suffering or humiliation forever and ever and ever. And so he may restore your life in this life. But I know with certain for every child of God, he will restore it in eternity. But restore it, he will. And and Peter says, the God of all grace, the God who uh, of all grace, all grace comes from God. The God of all grace will act for your good, and that grace will cause you to be humble and to stand and to glorify him in all that comes. He will himself, it's very intensive, God himself, he's going to perfect you, confirm you, strengthen you and establish you. And rather than doing a word study on each one, I just, I'm almost out of time. What that means is simple, is that all your loss and all your hurt that you're facing this morning will one day soon be made right. And all the persecution and mocking, it'll all be made known what was true and what was right about your character and who you were. All that you didn't fight and return evil and revile back and all that you've lost, and all of your sufferings, all the humiliations of life that have come upon you, they're going to be made right for all of eternity. A little drop compared to all of eternity being made right and restored with no more of this. Guys, this is all going to flip one day, and it's going to flip forever. Suffering first, and then glory. I just, I need us to have that mindset. Suffering. And then what's going to come is no more tears. It's done. Safe, blessed, peace for all of eternity. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, they're temporal. But the things which are not seen, the glory of God, are eternal, this promise forever. And so what a promise. The God of all grace who called you into his eternal glory. He's called you into it. You will be glorified. And you will dwell in glory forever. God has called you into this. And no roaring lion can ultimately devour you. Let him chew on you and roar all he wants. But hold on by faith in the promises of God. And that glory is going to follow the suffering that you're enduring this morning. And so this is a whole world and life view that you have to have or you will get devoured. For the promise of glory in this life from the Diabolos, he will come and you will renounce true glory for self-glory if you lose this. And I think one of the sweetest phrases I know that modifies this whole phrase of our calling into glory 
is, is in Christ. Everything comes to us in Christ. And next week, that's all we're going to look at. He's going to say the last phrase, peace, or in three weeks when we get to this, peace be to you all uh, who are in Christ. Every spiritual blessing and everything that we have comes from being in Christ. And because we're in Christ, we have all sufficiency for what we need to endure the trials and humiliations and persecutions and all that come upon us. Humility is I'm a branch and he's a vine and I draw everything from him. He's sufficient. And that's who in my hurting and trials and all my things, I come to this Christ and in him I find the strength and the power and believing and holding steadfast to the very end. So beautiful that we have been called into the midst of glory in Christ to share in it, and one day we're going to share in the fullness of it. And so this is the mighty hand of God. I want you to hear it as we close. It's a gracious hand that has called us into his glory, and it's going to bring us into the fullness of his glory. And through everything that the devil, the world, and our flesh will throw at us, this hand is going to bring us safely through these waters that we're facing today. But don't miss that we're to be sober and alert. I hope you don't miss. There's a real devil. And we need to quit drinking up this world and and be, be sober to this hope. And we need to be alert that he's trying to devour us with fear and anxieties. And we do it with an eternal reward that cannot be shaken. And these two do not play against each other. They're, they're married. They're, they're married. And so just they, they work in, in harmony. And so we, we see the, a beautiful theology of the sovereignty and the devil and our responsibility and our faith. And it just all ties together under the mighty hand of God. And it makes me steadfast, sure, and confident in this glory. And in closing, verse 11, to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. As I look at this fallen world, there's so much pain and suffering. So much hatred to Christ and his followers. There is a devil roaring. But this last verse tells me there's a sovereign God over it all. There's a sovereign God over every one of my humiliations. And so I just need this picture is that this hand that is bringing all of this into my life is the hand that's one day going to bring total and complete victory. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so I ask you an application. Can you add the amen? And all of your suffering and everything that you're facing this morning, can you now look up from this gorgeous, beautiful word and what it declared And can you see him still on his throne and then he's working for good? And what I've been preaching for this whole series is not just surrender, but a glad surrender. To to come now and say amen. And whatever you're facing, some of you have faced some incredible things, loss of children, loss of uh, spouses. There's just been so many trials. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to come and just open your hand to this God and complete surrender and trust to his wisdom and what he's doing and why and how and to to come under this beautiful hand. Peter was looking for the day when suffering is past and glory and peace and joy reign forevermore. And that's what he wants us to say, amen. I believe this and I know it's coming and I wait and I look and I hope in it. Is that your bedrock hope? That's what all of Peter has been driving to. And I want to ask you, Has the year and a half been vain or has it brought you to be able to say amen? Amen. This glory is certain and no matter what comes, I'm going to hold to this Christ and stand in faith waiting for his return. This whole letter is a call for a kind of people with a rock solid hope and a reward after this life. A hope that makes us a very peculiar people who walk this earth like our Savior. And so to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I just thank you for what Peter has been leading and driving and showing. And I pray that we would be a humble people. I pray that Christ would be all. That this blessed hope and putting that name on display and seeing as many uh, as possible in this world enter into this glory for all of eternity. 
God, I pray that, that you would open our eyes to what this life really is and quit ch chasing little trinkets and all the wrong hopes. We've been born again to this living hope of Jesus Christ raised from the dead, and certainly we will follow him in the end. God, we thank you that, that the one who believes in this, Jesus says, even if he dies, he will live. I pray for every heart, God, let them be glad. Let them walk around all day this week saying, I'm going to glory. I'm going to go to glory and how that's going to affect the way they look at everything that comes into their lives. Give them a hope. Causes the things of earth to grow strangely dim. And so I pray, let us fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of faith, Jesus Christ, as we run this race. And I pray, Lord, that, that we would uh, be able to understand there's a devil trying to devour us and make us anxious and fear. And you told us to come under your hand by casting all these anxieties upon it because that hand loves us and cares for us. What is there to fear under that hand? God, help us to quit looking to our own hands. And that's where anxiety comes from. And I pray, let every anxious heart lift their eyes now and look to this mighty hand that is their favorable Father loving hand working and promising to bring them to this glory that you have called us into. God, thank you for the certainty of it. Let it change and transform behavior. Let us quit fighting to get as much of this earth as we can get, but to have as much of Christ as possible this side of glory. God, let that be the, the heart of every child of God in here. And I pray for any unbeliever, Father, who's still in his pride, who's still looking to his own hands to get right with you, his own church attendance, his own Bible reading, his own service. God, I pray that you would break that pride even this morning. And in humility now, they would look up to the humble one hanging on a cross, bowing his head as a substitute in their place, one bearing your full wrath for their sin, one living the life that you've required of them. God, I thank you for the beauties and the glories of Christ. I pray that he would humble any unbeliever here today and that he would humble any believer who's lost sight of Christ alone and is looking to their own hands or merit. God, would you break that even this morning so that the grace of God could flow into our hearts in holding and believing and glorifying you with the days that you've given us on this earth. God, I thank you for Peter, and I thank you that you restored him. Lord, after he, he suffered, uh, you perfected and confirmed and strengthened and established him again. And God, I thank you that you've done that in so many lives here this morning, and there's some that need it even this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would restore them to that sweet place of hope and faith and trust in you alone. And it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen.